Hello everyone and welcome to the Get Ready for University webinar. My name is John Cheek, I'm the founder and director of Unit Aces, and I've got the easiest job this evening because it's my job to introduce the event and also introduce our speakers. This event is designed over just an evening and an hour, only over an hour or so to give you the key facts about university to support you when it comes to your future university decisions. So if you're thinking about university fees and finance, how to write a personal statement, how to research universities, why you might want to consider going to university, how to look after your mental health in advance and during university, or if you're a Welsh, if you're, if you're interested in Welsh language courses or at university or maybe studying bilingually, you have come to the right place. Myself and the panel are going to do our best to put on a really, really, really good event and really useful event for you. Now, I mentioned in terms of the event, we're going to give you the key facts about university to support you to make university decisions and that I was going to host it. So with that, I'm going to share my slides and show you what to expect. Great stuff. So let's get going. So I'm going to introduce the evening now. That's, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Then we're going to pass to the institutions that are joining us and the speakers that are joining us. And they're going to just in two minutes, each one in just two minutes, we're going to tell you a little bit more about their institution and a little bit more perhaps about their session as well. We're going to talk about how to prepare for your university application. And I'm joined by Hannah for that session. We're going to talk about how to research your university opportunities. And then Ned's going to join us for that, for that session. A guide to university fees and finance, which Lynette, Lynette uh, Linos from, from Bank University is going to deliver for us. We're going to talk about how to write your personal statement. And if anyone knows about the ABC method, Rebecca's going to tell you about the ABC method when it comes to writing your personal statements. We're also going to talk about how to give you some tips about looking after your mental health and well-being when preparing for university. And last but not least, we're going to be looking at, at studying in Welsh or bilingually. So if you're watching this as a, as a Welsh speaker and you're interested in going to university and you want to study in Welsh, the final session is going to look at opportunities when it comes to studying in Welsh or bilingual as well. So in terms of this session, it's going to be delivered in English, but the final session is going to be delivered in Welsh for those students who are interested in studying Welsh at university. So basically for the Welsh speakers, after Becky's session, you might, the, the English speakers will perhaps finish there, and then the Welsh speakers hopefully will stay then for Larry's session if you are interested in studying in Welsh or bilingual. But what we often find with these events, and I mentioned about the Q&A, is a lot of students that are watching this and just be thinking well, what, what what courses do each university offer that's speaking this evening so what i've done now as part of this introduction is just provided the different courses that each institution that is speaking tonight offers so if you look at the, the this slide just here you've got subjects on the left hand side so you've got say art media and design biological sciences etc going down the left hand side we've also got the universities that are joining us this evening at the top so what you can do is actually have a look at, for your subject area, and there's two of these, this is one of two pages of this subject areas. What you can do for your subject area is have a look at the university speaking and have a look if they actually do offer the course you're interested in. So if, it, if it's green, it means that they do. If it's red, it means they don't. I'll just give you 20 seconds, just have a quick look. So you've got subjects on the left and then you've got institutions present at the top. Just 15 more seconds, guys, just have a quick look. I'm just now going to move on to the second page because you might be looking at thinking your subject of interest is not on there. So there's two pages and it works exactly the same way. So this is the second page just here. Again, you've got subjects on the left hand side and then the institution speaking tonight at the top. So you can have a look for the green if they do deliver a subject that you are interested in. All right, I'm just going to move on now. So we've got absolutely loads to cover. So to give you a reminder of what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at things like how to prepare for university applications, how to research universities, fees and finance, writing personal statements and much more. But what we're going to start with first, if I'm just going to stop my share just here, is we're just going to hear from each speaker just for two minutes, just to find out a bit more about their institution before we get on the rest of the session. And with that, Anna, I'll pass things over to you, please. Uh, uh, thank you, John. So yeah, hi, everyone. Um, nice uh, to see you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, so as John said, my name is Hannah Turner and I represent Cardiff Metropolitan University, so Prevascal Metropolitan Cardiff. Um, Cardiff Met, if you don't know about us, um, obviously based in Cardiff, as it says on the tin, and we have two campuses in Llandaf and King Coyd campus. In terms of what we offer, um, we have five academic schools ranging across um, our School of Management, School of Technologies, 
School of Art and Design, School of Education and Social Policy, and then also our School of Sport and Health Sciences. So five academic schools offering a wide range of courses um, to hopefully suit some of your needs. Um, we're quite a modern university, careers focused and practical, some would say. Um, but yes, for tonight's session, what we're going to be focusing on in my session in terms of you know, how to prepare for university application, uh, we'll just be considering some key points for you to consider you know, before making a step of your personal statement, um, before starting off your research, questions to ask yourself to prepare you. So hopefully you'll find it useful. Uh, deal and vowed. Hello, Anasatha. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lynette and I'm from the University of Wales Trinity St. David. Uh, so we have three main campuses, um, all located in southwest Wales. So we've got um, Swansea City Centre, Carmarthen and Lampeter. We also have uh, learning centres in London, Cardiff and Birmingham as well. We offer a range of different courses on each campus. Uh, each campus is quite small, so you uh, feel really at home with us. Uh, we offer lots of creative courses, um, lots of um, career-focused courses as well, and we make sure that students uh, really get the experience that they need to go out into the wider world afterwards. So I'm looking forward to speaking to you tonight about doing some research. Um, yeah, and hopefully you'll find it a really useful um, evening. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Chinos and I'm from Bangor University. I'm from Chinos, I'm from Bangor and I'm from Bangor and I'm from Bangor and I'm from So I'm sure many of you have been to North Wales or familiar with the area. I'd like to say that Bangor's in sunny North Wales, but to be totally honest with you, the weather's been shocking today. Um, but we do have nice days. So um, we were established in 1884, we're a medium-sized university. So we have about 10,000 students in total and we have about 200 different courses. I think some of the main subject areas that we're known for, things like psychology, ocean sciences, environmental sciences, but we have a whole range of arts, humanities and other courses as well. So we're one of the only universities in the UK that offer you free membership to all our clubs, societies, volunteering and sports teams. We've got over 200 of them. And if you remember nothing else about Bangor this evening, you'll probably remember that you have a Quidditch team as one of those sports teams. So you can imagine that the list of things that we offer you are pretty extensive. Uh, so a lot of people decide to come to Bangor because of the small and friendly nature of the university in the surrounding area. We're only technically a city because we have a cathedral, so we're not a massive city. So it is the kind of place where you bump into people that you know all the time. And like I said, it's really friendly. It's also been voted as one of the cheapest places to be a student in the UK. So that's good news for all of our students studying with us. And if you did want to come and have a look around and see for yourself, we do have one more on-campus open day taking place on the 20th of November. And we do have a virtual one tomorrow evening as well, if you want to find out more. So tonight I have the enviable task of trying to talk to you about student fees and finance in a very short period of time. So if you've got any questions, like John's already mentioned, please just stick them in the Q&A, especially with something like finance, you might have something specific to you that you want to find out about. So really looking forward to the evening and hopefully, hopefully giving you all the information that you're looking for tonight. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Rebecca Bowen. I'm a senior student recruitment officer at the University of South Wales, Prifysgol Dea Cymru. Um, Prifysgol Dea Cymru, University of South Wales is a campus university, so we've got campuses in Pontypridd, Cardiff and Newport. At our Pontypridd campuses, you'll find courses in health, so nursing, midwifery. You'll also find courses like sports, science, humanities, so history, English, business, engineering. Uh, Cardiff is the home of our creative courses, so all of them are taught under one roof in the centre of Cardiff and then we've got a Newport campus where courses in education, teacher training and social work are offered. Really looking forward to speaking to you this evening about personal statements, how to write a good personal statement and wherever you are in that process at the moment I'm hoping that um, there'll be some useful takeaways for you so I'll, uh, I'll speak to you later. Diolch um, yn um, my name is Becky. I work for Wrexham Glyndor University as a student recruitment and engagement assistant. Um, Wrexham Glyndor University is quite a small, inclusive, um, community focused university with a lot of courses that kind of put the industry at the heart of the courses. We have four campuses in total. So we have our Northup campus where all of our animal sciences are based. We have St Asaph, we have Regent Street where all of our arts subjects are based and we have our main campus in Wrexham. 
Um, we have two faculties in total. So we have FAST, which is our faculty of art, science and technology, and we have our faculty of science of life sciences as well. Um, yep, so we're industry focused, we're based in the northeast of Wales, so connections to everywhere, to the coast, um, and also great train connections to kind of Chester and further afield as well, if you want to go visit that. Um, today, I'm going to be chatting to you about wellbeing. So hopefully you'll find my presentation after you've been loaded with all the information um, a little bit relaxing and hopefully you'll take a little bit um, of the wellbeing tips away with you. Thank you. Hello, Vidi Lori, a dwi'n gweithio i'r coleg Cymraeg Cynadaethol. Um, am y coleg yn gweithio gyda phob prifysgol yng Nghymru um, i ddysblygu cyfleoedd y studio Cyfrwng Cymraeg a dweithio ag i fyfyrwyr. Um, so the colleague, we work with all the universities in Wales to develop uh, Welsh medium um, and bilingual education for students. Um, we think that we have a lot of people who are in a cursus in the Gauch, the Governor Gumraig, and the Dawson Privescolion, and the Nova Guich, the Governor Gumraig, and the Sclorithas of Ariana Honegal, and the Puisigion, and the Governor Horse Foundation Sina. Yes, to do to go and come like a can do it. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, join uh, me later. And um, the uh, PowerPoint will be uh, bilingual and um, providing information on the courses available through the medium of Welsh um, resources and um, the scholarships available and also the, um, the advantages of studying through the medium of Welsh and bilingual. Thank you very much, Larry, and, and everyone for the introduction. I always think of events like this, it's really useful right at the start, just to have a couple of minutes, just to hear more about the speakers and also the institutions. So in terms of the format of the event tonight, we've got very, very, very whistle-stop presentations. So, so the presentations are going to be very short, and very sweet. We're not going to spend you know, 20, 30 minutes on each subject area. We're only going to be spending about 10 minutes on each one. So there might be other areas you want to explore afterwards, naturally. But what we're going to try and do is give you the key facts in a very short period of time. Not forgetting there is a Q&A open, so if you've got any questions at all that we can help you with, please do not hesitate to ask any questions. But in terms of the event, a big thank you to our speakers, big thank you to Hello Wales, who the event is delivered in collaboration to with tonight. So if I can now introduce our first speaker, and that's Hannah. Hannah's joining us from Cardiff Metropolitan University. And Hannah's, how we're going to do the event today is we're going to look at some of the pre-application topics, then we're going to move on to some of the more post-application topics. So Hannah's session is going to look at how to prepare for your university application. So if you're thinking about applying to university and you just don't know where to start, Hannah will very much help with that. So with that, Hannah, I'll pass things over to you, please. Gosh, thank you very much. So yeah, that was a great introduction there, John. I don't really have to go on and say what I'm going to do now. But um, yeah, so for the next 10 minutes, we're going to focus on how to prepare for your university application. Um, so this is all important, obviously, because if you are deciding to go to university, there is an application involved. And it's quite um, can be quite a lengthy process. But that's why it's great that you're here tonight in order to you know, start that process or complete that process if you're in year 13 or your final year of college as well. Um, so hopefully you will find it to be useful because um, for your UCAS application, for your application to university, there's quite a bit to think about. So if you've got a pen and paper, um, then feel free to make some useful notes. Um, but to begin with some key points to consider. So when it comes to university, so Lynette's gonna to touch more on this in her session, but research is crucial. The more research you can do, the better, because when you apply for university, as it is such a big decision to make, it's really important that you're confident and that you're happy in those decisions. Um, so researching is key. So the sooner you can start that, the better, definitely. And as I say, Lynette will give you a bit more information on that. What's really important as well is to make a note of any key skills that are required for that degree, um, any particular uh, careers focused skills, transferable skills, or if there's any particular work experience that you're expected to gain as well before applying for the degree. Just to ensure that you know you're applying for um, you know, the best degree possible for you and that you, know, you reach your full potential as well. We'll also have a think about some direct work experience that you can gain before going to university, some indirect work experience, and also think about your career aspirations. There's quite a lot for you to think about there, considering, um, you know, maybe you don't know all those answers yet, and that's okay. 
Um, but the main thing you can do is give yourself that time and make the effort in order to get those answers so that you can feel as happy as possible when it comes to um, completing your application to university. So just to begin with, some quick questions for you to maybe make a note of. Um, and what would be great is if you can answer all these questions in your spare time, then we know, yeah, you've got the thumbs up, you can apply for university, you're ready. Um, but these are some questions maybe just to start you off in terms of thinking about um, just being sure of your decisions. Um, so first off is, you know, what's your subject? Obviously, that's quite um, an obvious one there, thinking about maybe what you currently study at A-level or BTEC at school or college. Um, because in terms of the university opportunities that are out there, there are over 30,000 courses available to you uh, in the UK. So again, a lot of options there. So just to narrow that down, think about exactly what you love. Think about what you're passionate about. Definitely one of the best things you can do when it comes to picking a university degree is to pick something that you genuinely love. You're going to be doing it for at least three years. So pick something you actually enjoy. That's definitely the main thing. But that could be something that you don't currently study now at school or college. It could be a complete new subject for you. Um, so, for example, personally for me, I studied a, a degree in international tourism and events management. This wasn't an A-level I could do. This wasn't something I could do at college. So for me, I really looked at my hobbies and my interests and my skills and what I considered to be my strengths in order to make that decision. Another question to ask yourself is think about how do you like to learn? Um, so are you a more practical individual? Are you someone more... Um, Sort of you you like to, to read a lot more, to do a lot of research. How how you know how do you learn best? How are you assessed best? Um, so for example, do you like exams or do you prefer, prefer coursework and presentations? Because there's definitely degrees out there for to suit everyone. Um, so if you are um, you know, if you love exams and you like research and reading lots of academic literature, then there are they are courses for you. However, if you are someone who's a bit more practical, there are lots of careers focused courses for you to ask yourself where. So location, location, location is very important. So do you want to be close to home? Do you want to move away from home? Possibly from the pandemic, it could go one way or another in terms of where you want to go on to. And um, so that's really, really key to consider. You know, do you want to live um, and go to university by the coast and get that fresh sea air? Do you want to go to the countryside or do you want to have that city experience? Um, all options, good options, just comes down to your personal preference and what suits you. You need to think about as well where you see yourself in maybe five years time. So you do have to have a think about what your dream job is, what your career aspirations are, because this will influence what degree you choose at university. So if you're already making your application, you know, just be sure that you've looked at the career aspirations and what you could do with your degree at the end. What are your ambitions as well? That links to that as well. Think about what you want to do in the future. Think where that degree can take you because generally like degrees can open so many doors to you, sometimes not necessarily in the subject that you even studied, um, but because university gives you so many skills and transferable skills, it can take you anywhere. Think about what you need to research. Really think about what's important to you. Is it the social aspects? Is it the quality of teaching? Is it the modules that are available, the assessments, work placement opportunities, study abroad opportunities? Lots to think about there. But once you know what's important um, to you, then go ahead and make um, and you know do your research in that area. And then just thinking about what next. Um, so what you can do now before you go on to university, before you complete your application to help you with it, to make it as easy as possible for you. So one thing I did mention at the start in the key points was key um, skills. Um, so what you want to do maybe um, is to look at sort of what key skills are required at um, on the course pages of any degrees that you're interested in. Think about careers related skills as well. Um, so if there are any particular skills that are required from a specific career that you want to go into, what are they? Do you have them already? Can you develop now before university? Or are you using university as that opportunity to do so? Also consider just general university life skills as well um, to help you prepare for your application. You know, think about what you can offer 
the university as well? Is it the fact that you could that you want to play for this sports team? Um, is it the fact that you want to get involved in any societies or anything like that? Um, so do consider your key skills when you, it comes to preparing for your university application. Think about any direct experience. So again, I'm sure this will be raised later um, with Rebecca when it comes to sort of your personal statements. But think about what work experience that you've already got, um, because that might influence you in terms of uh, in terms of choosing your, your university degree. Or think about what you can do now before you go on to university to help you with that transition, to help you when it then comes to work experience on your degree. Um, so work experience, um, what have you done already or what are you hoping to do before you go on to university? This may not be the traditional sense of work experience in the past uh, year and a half or so. Um, if you do get the opportunity to do that, then go ahead. There's nothing better than work experience to see if you like something, or maybe if you don't like something. Think as well about the Welsh Back. The Welsh Back offers you a host of skills that you can develop. Really take advantage of the opportunities that the Welsh Back provides you. For example, your individual project, you're developing research skills, independent study, problem solving, critical analysis, all these things that universities love. Um, so really take advantage of those opportunities and like the en uh, enterprise uh, project and everything like that. Have a listen for media um, and podcasts that are related to any subject areas that you want to study too. Consider any online training opportunities or sort of taster events that universities put on. If you see any that they um, put on um, or your teacher gives you the opportunity to attend them, go for it. Again, it's a great way to find out if you like that subject or if you don't um, and can give you a real taste for university life. Indirect work experience as well, this can really help prepare you for your university application. It's great to have the direct work experience that's related to your course, but also the indirect experience. At universities, we like to see well-rounded students. We like to see people who have the experience of this subject, but also people with other, um, other skills, other hobbies and interests. And we like to see what you've done sort of outside of that subject area. So if you've got a part-time job, fair play keep at it because um, you'll gain a lot of skills from that, um, like communication and teamwork, time management and organisation. If there's any volunteering opportunities in your community, go ahead and make the most of those. And keep up with any hobbies and interests, definitely, because you can continue these on to university um, or you can pick up a whole new hobby at uni, who knows? Um, but keep up with these, definitely, because this will also help you um, with your mental health, you know, keeping up with those hobbies and interests and just make the most of any opportunity that comes your way because you never know what that could lead on to. You never know what skills you could develop from that and how that could inspire you for your university application too. In terms of your next steps then, go on open days, whether they're virtual or physical, um, so there are a lot of open days happening um, now, this autumn, this side of Christmas, and there'll be some the other side of Christmas as well. Open days, I'm sure everyone else will agree with me, are there sometimes the best ways to find out if that course university are right for you. You just get that gut instinct straight away. You know whether it's the right decision. Make the most of any live chat opportunities. Uh, the fact that you're here tonight is a great step because you can ask anything in the Q&A. Um, speak to current students as well. Great platforms out there like Unibuddy, where you can have a chat with students who are currently studying the degree. And then think about things like your personal statement, like Rebecca will cover soon, and think about things like any virtual exhibitions or hopefully some in person exhibitions next year as well that you can attend. Really make the most of all of those opportunities. Ask as many questions as possible. As John said at the start, no question is a silly question. Um, you know, being Cardiff Metropolitan, we've heard a, a lot about, you know, are you the police and all of that? That's fine. Ask us. Go for it. Um, so, yeah, don't be afraid to ask any questions and visit those open days, uh, campus tours, anything like that to really prepare you for university because it really, really will be beneficial to you. Um, so, yes, hopefully this has helped you. It's been a whistle-stop tour um, in, in terms of helping you prepare for your university application. 
here's just an example of sort of Unibuddy and what sort of students are out there, students from various courses, from various places. Go and have a chat with them. They're very honest and they're very, very lovely for you to talk to. Um, but if you do have any uh, further questions about Cardiff Met, uh, about UCAS, about any of the courses that we offer, about your UCAS application, then don't hesitate to get in touch. You're more than welcome to, Christ up in us. Um, I love having a chat with anyone that wants to, as you can probably tell as I've gone on. <laughs> um, but yeah, feel free to get in touch. Uh, Dioff and Val, I hope that was useful to you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, excellent session looking at how to prepare for all your university application. So really appreciate that. If you've got any questions, Hannah, do not hesitate to use the, the Q&A. So our next speaker is Lynette, who's joining us from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. So Hannah spoke about how to prepare for your university application. Lynette's now going to talk about how to research universities. And one thing, just before Lynette start, starts the session, you will never regret the more research you're doing. So whenever I speak to students that are actually at university, so many will say, I like this course, but I wish I'd spent more time looking at different courses. Or I love this university, but perhaps I'll perhaps if I'd have thought about it more, I might have picked a university that is more have more facilities that meet my interests, etc. So do, do, do research universities, you will not regret it. But with that, then I'll pass things over to you, please. So thanks, Hannah, for your um uh, presentation there. So I'm going to talk about um, researching for university. Um, so I will be covering uh, some things like Hannah talked about as well. But um, like Hannah said, there, it's a really good idea to make a list of things that are important to you and what you're looking for in a university. Um, so just to put it into a bit of a perspective, there are, well, when I did, looked at UCAS earlier today, there are 35,504 undergraduate courses available for you to choose from, and there are 338 uh, providers. So that is a lot of courses and um, providers out there. So where do you go from here? How do you decide where you want to go and what course you want to study? So hopefully the session will help you with that. So obviously, um, where would you start? You probably would start by looking at what course you might want to study. Some people are really lucky, they know exactly what course they want to study, but others then they've got lots of ideas, they don't know where to go maybe, so kind of everybody's in different places, but doing your research is really important. And even if you have a strong idea of what you want to do, make sure you do look into what is available because you will be surprised about what different courses are available and maybe something else will take your interest then, okay? Um, one of the best places I would suggest um, to start off with is looking at the UCAS website. So um, UCAS is the admissions um, service for um, universities. So all universities will have their courses up there and you have to go through UCAS to get to university. So everybody will have their courses up there. Um, and this is where you can find um, what providers are out there um, what courses are out there and um, everything like that. Um, so they've got a search tool on their uh, website. So it's good to look at search tools so you can put in a general course and it'll come up with all the universities that offer that course. Uh, you could put in something more specialised. You could put in a certain um, uh, institute or uh, area, kind of ge geographical area that you want to study in. So if you want to stay in Wales, you could um, choose all the universities in Wales and then uh, the course that you might be interested in as well there then, okay? So yeah, really handy um, uh, search tool they've got there for courses. They've also got um, uh, something called UCAS Hub where you can actually um, store all of your um, choices as well. So you might find that you're interested in several courses uh, so you can put them all in one place and compare them as well. So that's really important to do as well. And remember as well, when you're doing your um, UCAS choices, you have got five um, university courses to put on your application form as well. So you've got five courses to choose from. Um, there are lots of other websites and um, providers that offer um, uh, information as well about um, university courses. So obviously Unitaste Days is a really good one uh, and John's done an excellent job of collecting lots of information from universities. 
there are lots of webinars like this on the website, but also um, subject specific webinars as well. So it's worth having a look at what your new taste days have to offer. Um, but things like um, you've got um, what uni, national student surveys as well, looking at how universities are doing in uh, league tables and so on is a good way of searching universities as well. If you are looking at league tables, make sure that you're looking at things that are important for you. So some universities might rank higher in certain um, league tables, but they might be ranking higher because they do more research or something like that, like that, but maybe the actual teaching isn't so strong. So make sure that you're picking out um, the information that is really important to yourself then. Um, also, um, picking up prospectuses from universities is a really good way of um, getting the information that you need. Uh, we usually do UCAS phase um, where, and the um, higher education phase as well, where you're able to go around and speak to um, universities, collect prospectuses, and then you probably come home with a big um, um, pile of prospectuses that you can um, read through. We are hoping that these will go on in 2022, but if you're imply, applying now, maybe you can um, ask universities to send them on to you, okay? So universities will send them on, but hopefully when we get out to do some more um, higher education phase, we'll see lots of you at these phase and you can pick up as many prospectuses as you want. And you can then read through them, see what subjects are available and um, find out more about the university and find out about accommodation, club societies and things like that as well. So prospectuses are really handy. Also, um, make sure that you look at university websites as well. So um, again, uh, a website that the university will host all the courses on the website. Um, so you can find out what courses are available and they'll go into a bit more detail maybe on the website and the website will always be up to date as well. So make sure that you look into that. Um, on our website, there is uh, opportunities for you to gain more information about the course. You can also send uh, messages to the admission tutors as well. So any questions that you've got at all about the university or a particular course, or if you want more information, you can send off to the university then to get that information. Uh, and Hannah's talked about open days as well. So yeah, open days are really important and we're really glad that we are running um, live open days now. So we've got a few dates there at the end of um, November for our campuses and also the beginning of um, December. So make sure that you do come along to open days. We are still running virtual events as well. So taster sessions, uh, student experiences and stuff like that virtually as well. So if you can't attend a, 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 an actual open day, make sure that you attend a virtual open day. And yeah, open days are so important. So we're really glad that we're able to run open days again. It's an opportunity for you to really get a feel of the university and make sure that you're feeling at home at the university. Uh, I've heard so many of our students say that maybe they were going to go somewhere else, but once they come to an open day in uh, Trinity St. David, they changed their mind. They, they just felt really at home there. And I'm sure the other universities here today have had similar reactions from um, people coming to open days. We also have um, people that come to open days more than once as well. So if you haven't um, get, got all your answers or if you want to go back for a second viewing, maybe it's kind of we, we welcome people onto the campus and then to open days as many times as you want to. So yeah, really important to get to an open day. Make sure that you are prepared for the open day though. So think about what you want to find out during the open day. Uh, if you have any questions at all about the course, accommodation, um, club societies, even small things like where would you park your car and things like that, just think about them and ask them at the open days. We um, want you to get all the answers or as much of the answers as possible during the, the open day. So make sure that you um, do come prepared and maybe bring somebody along with you as well that will give you um, a good um, uh, feeling of the open day as well so that you can uh, ask them for their opinion as well for the, from the open day. Okay, um, Hannah also spoke about Unibuddy, so uh, at Trinity St. David we've also got Unibuddy, um, so yeah, it's a good way of chatting to students, 
um, before you get there as well to just make sure that it's the right kind of course for you. Um, getting that um, first-hand experience from somebody who's at the university is currently studying is a really good idea. Uh, also ask any friends that you've got in university. So really kind of ask them what, what's it like? What, what do they like about university? Maybe what they would have done differently as well, kind of making sure that you're um, getting all the information that you need. So yeah, do talk to current students. Okay, um, so yeah, we've touched there about um, a few ways of searching for university courses. Uh, there are um, things to consider as well with your courses at the university. So think about what subject area you're interested in and what you might want to study. Sorry, my dog's joined me for this session now. Um, yeah, and think about things like, um, so uh, universities will have um, very similar titles to courses, but they might be totally different at different universities. So do make sure that you do your uh, research into what the subject, uh, well, subject in the course is going to be like at the university that you want to study at. Uh, do look at their entry requirements as well. Um, so make sure that you do know what they're asking for, whether they are A-level results, BTEC results, if they want you to have certain um, uh, work experience. Hannah was talking a lot about what um, skills and qualities you have. So make sure that you look into those kind of things as well with entry requirements. Uh, some of you might already know what you want to do in the future so do make sure that the course that you're going on to do will allow you to do that career in the future as well um, and that it is um, also maybe accredited so we've got accreditation down there at the bottom some some courses will well some careers will ask that you've got accreditation so having that during your time at university will be really handy then uh, look at things like your interests and hobbies. So the course doesn't have to be related to what you're studying at the moment at all. It could be related to your interests and hobbies. So yeah, kind of um, do look into um, what's available in that side as well. Look at learning styles as well. So universities will have different uh, learning styles. Uh, at the University of Wales Trinity St David, we are quite a small university. Uh, our courses are um, more... Uh, in uh, classrooms rather than lectures. We like to, for our students to get involved. So we won't have large lecture theatres. It will be more workshops and uh, availability for students to get involved with um, different styles of learning and practical work. Um, look into whether the university will offer you time out in industry and work experience. So making sure that you've got the uh, skills required after you've finished at university. Is maybe you want to go and study abroad um, for a semester or do a sandwich year. So look into what the universities might offer for you there as well. Um, but if you are interested in studying um, in Welsh or bilingually, there's lots of opportunities. So make sure that you stay on and listen to Lowry session in a bit. Uh, and then once you've uh, found out that which course you might want to do, make sure that you do consider the university as a whole as well. Um, so consider things like the location of the university, are you looking for a university that's in a city? Would you prefer a quieter location? Are you looking for a campus location? So make sure that you do look into that. I think um, we're quite lucky at the University of Wales Trinity St David. We've got all, all aspects covered with our three main campuses. Um, look at the reputation of the um, university and the different departments as well. Um, from going to the um, open days, what's the atmosphere like there? What are the lecturers like? What are the current students saying about the university? Look at student support as well. So what kind of support will you need at the university? If you need any learning support, will the university be able to um, support you or any financial support or any emotional support as well? So make sure that the university is able to provide you with the support that you need. Um, do look into the employment um, prospects from the course that you're doing as well. So are the, the um, students in employment or further uh, study after they've qualified as well, after they've graduated? 
Also look at things like um, facilities. Um, make sure when you're looking at facilities, some universities might have really fancy facilities, but are they available for students to use all the time or are they just there for the PhD students? We at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, make sure that our students have um, plenty of access to facilities uh, or that we've got on offer as well then, okay? Um, and the accommodation as well is important. So if you're thinking about moving away from home, whether you're moving five minutes down the road or five hours down the road, make sure that you're looking at the accommodation and look at the accommodation that's available for you throughout your time at university, not just for your first year. Will you, will you have a co accommodation during your second and third year? And if not, where will you live during that time then? Uh, some of the things to consider as well, remember it's not just about your study at university, we want to make sure that you're having a good time as well and that you enjoy yourself. So yeah, looking at clubs and societies is a really good idea. Um, yeah, and talking to the student union again, you'll get a lot of information from clubs and societies there and talking to the students as well. Uh, look into what scholarships and bursaries uh, to the universities offer. So if you can get extra money for doing your course, that's really handy and helpful as well. Uh, look at the tuition fee costs as well, living costs. So she must have mentioned there that uh, Bangor is quite cheap to uh, live in. So yeah, we find that in Wales in general. So uh, we're quite west in Wales here. So uh, living costs with us at Trinity St. David is also relatively um, lower than maybe it would be in larger cities as well. And recommendations from um, friends, family, teachers and advisors is a really good way of gauging uh, if the university is right for you. And you'll have a feel from going to open days and um, yeah, talking to the university and looking at the website if it's the right place for you. So just before I end, then some do's and don'ts then. Um, so don't let others decide for you. So make sure it's your own decision. It's not somebody in your family that are deciding for you or you're not going to the university just because your friends are being there. So do make sure it's your decision and you're choosing it because it's something that you really want to do and it's something that you really love to study. And don't be afraid to aim high either, okay? Do have dreams and aspirations and kind of uh, aim for what you really want to do as well. And then some do's there then, so plenty of research, yeah. I can't um, say that enough. Do your research, kind of make sure that you have uh, looked into what courses are available and where they're available and what else is important for you. So um, from the list you might have started doing with Hannah, Keep doing the list and add to it and add to what's important to you and um, what do you want to get out of the university as well. Um, consider the bigger picture. So think about what you might be doing in a few years time, not just next year or the following year. Think about the bigger picture. Ask the questions. Yeah, we've said that a lot today, tonight. Um, ask the questions. So if you've got any questions, do pop them in the chat or you can get in touch with any of us um, after this event. Um, on our websites um, also come along to open days like I said do have the questions we have been doing this job for quite a long time now never heard the silly question so do ask the questions okay and really think if you can imagine yourself there so you should feel quite excited about um, your final decisions on where you want to study okay and that's it from me so I'll hand back over to John Thank you very much, Ned. Another brilliant session. So, Ned, joining us from the University, University of Wales, from St. David. Love the do's and don'ts, the Ned. And, and also, um, Hannah mentioned about open days as well, but just as another open day shout out, there'll be a lot of open days coming around this period of time. Some have been pushed back because you know, for obvious reasons. I can't, they're speaking as someone that's previously worked for universities, uh, universities now running an events website. I can't underestimate the, the importance of visiting an open day. It makes no sense to me that a student can go to a university and not having been there. Even if you just go to open days to see if you ideally like the area, but you might go to that area and decide that it's not for you at all. And that's why open days are great. And just one final thing to finish on, and I don't know where I read it, but I read somewhere, so do take this with a pinch of salt, that about 40% of students that go to university end up living where they studied after they finished. And the reason that was where this article that I read, which I can't remember where it was now, but it's because you... You might meet a long-term partner at university and therefore stay in that area because you've got that area in common. You might get a part-time job at university and it turns into a full-time job, so you still stay in that area. So visiting the area, visiting over days, um, can't underestimate the importance of that. But moving on, 
Um, if I can now introduce our next speaker, that's Linos, who's joining us from Bangor University. Linos has got a very, very, very difficult job because he's student fees and finance is a complicated subject and it's a long-winded subject. It's also the biggest barrier to universities, so the biggest reason that students don't, don't generally go to university. Sorry, Linos, more, Linos, more pressure on you. Um, but it's a really important area. I'm really glad that Linos is, is willing to run a session on it. And with that, I'll pass things to Linos, joining us from Bangor University, please. Great, thank you very much, John. Good morning, I'm Paul. We're here. Here, no student can get a scores match and then can hit my verbal. Chris, I have a question. I took him right. Air vote the Cavalini at the Russian snag. We can cover you here. So, as you've already heard, my name is Kina. I'm from Bangor University, and I have this wonderful task of telling you about student finance. Now, there is an awful lot to get through, but. If you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A, because what I find with student finance a lot of the time is that you ask very specific questions to you. So whilst I'm giving you the kind of general information this evening, um, there is going to be quite a bit of research on your part looking into it. So hopefully we'll get through as much as I can in 10 minutes. But I think and this seems to be a running theme of the evening. Um, my message to you in terms of the finance side of things is also do your research. So work out what you're getting, how you're going to get it, what your costs are going to be and work out the situation for you as an individual. Now, I can't promise that my dog is going to crash my Zoom like it did for Lynette. So uh, hopefully you'll still be interested in what I have to say despite that. But like I said, hopefully it'll give you a lot of information about how it all works. So first of all, then, how does it work generally? Well, funding for UK students is devolved between the four different organisations that are responsible for assessing student finance awards. So essentially, you will make an application to the organisation that is, represents the region that you live before you go off to university. So if you're joining us from England this evening, it's Student Finance England. If you're joining us from Northern Ireland, it's Student Finance Northern Ireland. If you're joining us from Scotland, it's the Scottish Award Agency for Scotland. And if you're joining us from Wales, it's Student Finance Wales. So like I said, it is regional. So it's all done through the specific area that you're from before you start at university. But the situation with tuition fees is the same regardless of which part of the UK that you're coming from. So this is the simplest part, I guess, of student finance. So with the tuition fees, that's essentially what you pay for your course. So it's not the other costs at university, it's just what your course costs to study it whilst you're there. So university tuition fees will vary, not just between institutions, but potentially within the institution as well, depending on the subject that you're studying. So there's not one set amount for tuition fees across the UK. So if you've got a rough idea about which course you're interested in or which university you want to go to, it's a good idea to take a look at those tuition fees. So they can be anything up to £9,250 a year. Now in Wales, because we've got a slightly different funding body, we can only charge up to 9000 So I don't know if you see that as a slight bargain. So I'd obviously say, you know, come to Wales, the tuition fees are slightly lower, but they can range from anything up to 6000 up to that £9,250,000 mark. So we at Bangor will charge 9000 for all the courses courses that we run but like I said there can be some variation within the different institutions. Now the average tuition fee at the moment in the UK is something like £8,875. So I guess the best way of approaching this is assuming that you're looking at around about £9,000 a year. If you find somewhere that's cheaper which is where you want to be and the course you're interested in then great. But don't ever choose a course just because it's slightly cheaper. Because although you might feel that you're saving £1,000 a year on the tuition fees, you're going to be spending a lot more other money. It's not just the tuition fee costs. So, you know, there's no point thinking, well, it's a bit of a false economy. I'll save £1,000. Or actually, if it's the wrong place for you, you're throwing good money after bad, essentially. So choose your course, find out how much it is. Now, eligible students don't have to pay any tuition fees before starting their course or whilst they're studying at university. So here's the thing. If you're a new UK student, you're entitled to a tuition fee loan to cover your tuition fee costs. So this is really simple. You apply through that regional funding and you say, I'd like a tuition fee loan, please. However much your tuition fees are. That's how much a tuition fee loan is. And that goes straight to the university. So they don't deposit £9,000 in your bank account at the start of the year and hope that it makes its way to the university. It goes straight there. So you're entitled to this tuition fee loan if you're a new UK student. However much your course costs, that's how much the tuition fee loan is. And that gets paid directly to the university. So really simple with the tuition fees. And no need to have any money up front or whilst you're studying for these. And even if you are in the lucky position, of being able to do that, I recommend that you don't 
just because the vast majority of people are better off taking off taking um, out the tuition fee loan and if you do have any savings or any money elsewhere it's better to spend that on potential living costs that you have as a student or maybe putting towards a deposit for a house in the future and that sort of thing and i'll explain a bit more about why that's the case shortly now with living costs and maintenance support it is quite different to the tuition fee loans so we're talking about taxable income in this situation because in the uk uk students have means tested student finance which means for all of you joining us this evening it depends upon your household income as to how much money is going to be available to cover your living costs whilst you're at university so i'm going to be talking about maintenance loans which is money that you borrow that you then potentially have to pay back depending on your circumstances i'm talking about grants which is essentially free money that's available that doesn't have to be repaid and i might be talking about some of the allowances as well now these are all determined by the student's taxable household income so what we're talking about with household income is either your parents or if you're a mature student your partner's income so it's within that household so if you live with both parents we're looking at the income of both of them if you live with one parent that we're looking at just their income if your parents are separated it's the income of the parent that you live with but if there's a step parent in that household as well we're also looking at their income you may be living with guardians if that's the case we're looking at their household income it's never any other relatives like brothers or um, any other siblings or maybe any, any other relatives in the household um, so it's this household income that's the important part of this student finance. Now for 2022 entry, we're looking at the proof of taxable income for the year 2020 to 2021. That's because student finance applications tend to open around about February, March time. So they're looking at the income for the full tax year, the year prior to that. And obviously the tax year starts in April. So what's really important, especially with recent things, is if your household income has decreased by 15% or more, you can ask that your student finance is reassessed for the current academic year so it's the current year income assessment so with all the things that have been happening recently with the pandemic with furlough people changing their circumstances maybe um your parents work on maybe kind of a bonus or commission based salary so if there's a 15 percent decrease then you can ask for that current year assessment and we've seen more people doing that recently because there's been more flexibility and change in people's circumstances so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on two areas of this maintenance side of things with the maintenance and the money that you get from it. So I'm going to look at students from England and I'm going to look at students from Wales. So if you have it from the other Armavari or Gumbri. But if you do join if you are joining us this evening from Scotland or Ireland, Northern Ireland, you can you can ask some questions in the chat. Um, but also, you know, if you've got anything else that you want to ask about, um, please um, you know, look at the and do the research like I was mentioning earlier, that's the important thing. So the table that we're looking at here is the table that most of you are probably going to fall into, is students from England who are studying away from home but outside of London. So please be aware that the amount of money that you'll get will depend on whether or not you're living with your parents. So they tend to offer you less money if you're living with your parents because they think your costs are lower. Also looking at whether or not you're outside of London because if you're in London, you get more money because the costs tend to be higher. And there's also different amounts of money if you're studying or living abroad as part of your course as well. So you'll see there's three columns in this table. The first one is taxable household income, which I've already talked about. So as you'll see in that column, it increases as it goes down. So we start to £25,000 or under, and we go up to £62,286. The second column is maintenance loan. So this is how much loan you will get from Student Finance England if that's your household income. So if you're £25,000 or lower, you'll get the highest amount in each of the categories, which for living away from home outside of London is £9,488. But if you're £62,286 or higher, then you'll get the minimum amount available in this category, which is £4,422. So you may be able to work out here which one you fall into. Now, this last column is something that you don't see a lot of. It's household contribution. So the contribution of your parents or your partners. You will not see any mention of this at the moment, but Martin Lewis, the money saving expert, has actually been in discussions with the government this week to try and make more of this. So I'm hoping this is going to change for you and for the next set of students going to university, they make more of this. So essentially, the reason your maintenance loan decreases as your household income increases is because there's an assumption that the parents or partners can help financially. So you can see there, there's the rough amounts that they think that you need from home to help with the student loan, with the maintenance loan side of things. So it's really important that you work out roughly 
what your loan's going to be if you're if you're a student from England in this category. Work out what your costs are going to be at university and work out if there's going to be any shortfall. Because if there is, you've got to make up that money somewhere else. So I would say that most of the students at Bangor University spend about four and a half thousand pounds on their halls of residence each year. So it doesn't take you long to work out that if you're at the bottom of this table, your maintenance loan might not even cover your accommodation costs, let alone give you money to live off. And this is what is not talked about enough for student finance from the students from England. So work out what your household income is, work out what the maintenance loan is, work out what your costs are at university and find out are there savings? Do you have to get a part-time job? Are your parents a partner going to help you financially? Is there any inheritance? Maybe you're lucky enough to have that, but it's really important that you have the chat at home so that everybody knows where they stand in terms of how much money is available to you if the maintenance loan isn't enough. Now for next year, they have um, put out the proposed student finance figures for 2022, but these are still subject to parliamentary approval, so they're not set in stone yet. I should have probably mentioned at the start, we don't necessarily have the figures for 2022 entry. They normally are released between now and the end of the year, so keep an eye out for it. So this is what they've released, but they have to be subject to final parliamentary approval. If you study away from home, um, so the maximum amount you can get is 9,706. Living with parents is 8,171. Studying in London, but will not with your parents is 12,667 and living or studying abroad is 11,116 pounds so that's for England that's the maximum amounts but like I said it will still depend where you are with your household income as to how much of each of those different categories you're entitled to so it's really important like I've said at the start that you do your research and work out what the situation is for you now for Welsh students it is very different so I'm going to take you through the table here. So we don't have the figures yet for 2022. So these are the figures for people who started in September. So the approach that Student Finance Wales have is that everybody should have the same amount of money, regardless of what the household income is. But your household income will determine how much you get through a non-repayable grant, which is essentially a source of free money, and how much you get through the maintenance loan, which has to be paid back. So we've got five columns in this table. So the first one is the household income. So you'll see I've got slightly different thresholds in Wales there. So the minimum is £18,370 or under, and the maximum is 59200 the next one is the grant that you will get based on that household income. So this is the money that you don't have to repay. So you get that and it's non-repayable. The next column then is the loan. So this is the repayable amount of the money that you get from Student Finance Wales that you have to repay. And then the two columns at the end is the maintenance grant if you stay at home and the maintenance loan if you're staying at home. So like I said, there's slightly um, slow, um, smaller amounts for you in that table. So again, you'll see as you move down this table, the grant decreases, the loan increases, but people get the same amount of funding from Student Finance Wales. So you'll have the same amount of money to live off Regardless of what your household income is, it's just how much you have to repay and how much is non-repayable is different. So it's very different from students joining, um, going to university from England because you don't necessarily have to have the chat or look for extra finance elsewhere that you might do with some of the other student finance systems. So it's very different. And like I mentioned at the start, it all depends on where you live before you go to university, not which university you go to, but where you live before you go to university. Now, the good news is there is extra financial help there to, to help students out. So it depends, again, on your own circumstances, but there may be bursaries and scholarships that will help you out financially. So again, you've got to do your research. Again, this is going to be the key thing that you get told this evening because the scholarships and bursaries vary between the institutions and also between the courses as well. So we have some scholarships for some of our subjects at Bangor that we don't offer for some of the others. So you really have to look at websites, contact universities and see what's available. Now, bursaries and scholarships are all looked at additionally to any of the other finance. So they're not taken into account when deciding your loan or your grant or anything like that. This is a standalone kind of area of student finance that you can look into that can help you out financially and again it's non-repayable so essentially it's a form of free money that you've got available to you here so just to give you an example some of the bursaries that we have 
based on your household income, Banger will give you 500 or thousand pounds. There's a carer's bursary of a thousand pounds annually available. And there's a startup bursary of a thousand pounds in the first year for students who are estranged or students who are from care. So there's no one website you can go to, put your details in and everything flags up. You are going to have to do a bit of detective work and look into what's available. And again, some other examples at Bangor. This is not an exhaustive list. There's so much more out there. We've got sports scholarships of up to £3,000 a year available if you're good at a particular sport. Now, that does have to be spent on specific things linked to the sport, but a lot of other bursaries and scholarships don't have those kind of um, conditions attached to them. We have entrance scholarships, about 40 merit scholarships worth up to £3,000 a year. You sit a two-hour exam in your school or college in the subject you've chosen from a list of about 30. So I always say anybody's thinking of applying for university, if there's something like this, sit the exam, worst case scenario, two hours of your time, good exam practice, and you might have studied beforehand. Um, best case scenario, you could get £3,000. So it's always worth looking into these. And then there's also Colic and Mariah Kennedy Lethal scholarships. So I'm not going to talk too much about these because I know laurie has got um, a session coming up soon and she's going to cover them much more comprehensively than I can. Um, but again, there's scholarships linked to studying part or some of your course through the medium of Welsh. And for those of you thinking, you know, you're missing out on some of the bits in Welsh today, we do offer Welsh lessons at university, so definitely sign up to them and you can pick up the basics whilst you're a student with us. Now, there's also additional support for some students, depending on what category you kind of fall into. So some of you studying NHS um, courses may be able to get course funding. So at Bangor, that's nursing, midwifery and radiography. It's other courses at other universities, but it isn't medicine courses, just to be clear. So essentially, if you come to study any of those courses at Bangor, you have two options. You can borrow through student finance, like I've already mentioned, like you would do on any other course, and pay back that money at the end of your time at university. Or the other option is to sign up and uh, commit to working for NHS Wales for two years after you've graduated. NHS Wales will then pay your tuition fees. And instead of getting a maintenance loan, there's a maintenance bursary that you can get, which again is non-repayable and a smaller loan to go alongside that. So there's definite benefits to studying these courses in Wales that you might want to look at. There's also the disabled student allowance. Now, this isn't necessarily a specific amount of money, but if you have extra essential costs that you incur as a direct result of a disability, a long term illness or specific learning difficulty, the DSA could cover that. So look into it. It could be that you need extra software, um, maybe because of a learning difficulty. It could be that you need transport to get around campus because of a, a disability that you have. It could be that you need maybe to pay staff to help you out. You know, whatever it is, there's lots of different things that it could possibly cover. So look into that and then you've also got a child care grant parents learning allowance or adult dependence grant again if you fall into these categories so there is additional support out there it depends again on your own individual circumstances so just to give you a summary full-time support then it's variable tuition fees of up to £9,250 for next September onwards no upfront tuition fees payable and a tuition fee loan for every new UK student to cover how much their course costs there's a maintenance loan for your living costs and a grant maybe for some students depending on which region you're applying from scholarships and bursaries available and also extra financial help for some students so when it comes to applying for funding, the vast majority of people do it online. You can still download a paper application form, but these are the different websites that you can go to. Also, this is where you'll find the information for your specific region. So I won't go through it all, but obviously, if you want to go back and have a look and look at these websites, lots of information on there. And applications normally open around about February, March time before the September when you start at the university. So I just want to finish off just with some very short budgeting tips, which I find I get asked a lot of questions about. As I've gone on quite a bit about know your income, know what your maintenance loans are, any grants, bursaries, if you've got any savings, part-time earnings, parental support, so you work out how much money that you have. Then know your costs, your rent, your food, your books, your course equipment, travel, your phone contract, any other costs you're going to have. So work out how much you need and how much you're going to have to budget for on those different things. Now, student finance awards are paying three instalments throughout the year. So work out a budget for each term because they do also vary in duration. And then also pay for the important things up front, like your halls of residence, any course equipment that you have, so that you know then what you've got left for the rest of the, of the term to kind of pay for any other costs. Always check that your valuables are insured in halls of residence. They are at Bangor University, but it's worth checking that wherever you go. 
You may want to consider a part-time or a summer job. We have lots of different things available for students to help them out financially. Um, so you, you do want to look at that, but we do recommend as a university that you don't do more than 16 hours a week, just because it could be detrimental to your studies. Open a student bank account. Ask if you're entitled to an overdraft facility, not to rely on, but have it as a backup in case you need to in an emergency. And with the student bank accounts, there's different incentives as well. And normally paying for a rail card for you every year is better than getting a £25 voucher for something, for example. Make sure you've got money when you arrive. Now, your loans and grants are paid into your bank account normally three to five days after you register, so you don't necessarily get it immediately. I think the most important piece of advice, if you need advice or help, speak to the student money advisors at the university. We've got Wendy and Kim at ours who are absolutely fantastic. Don't get into trouble. Speak to them first and know everything inside out, and they can help you with a whole range of different things, regardless of which university you've gone to. So that's it. Sorry, there's an awful lot to cram in. So I hope you found it useful. But if you want to find out more, have a look at these websites. So you've got our website, student finance pages. You've got the government information, on how repaying your loan works. Money saving expert Martin Lewis is brilliant. He's got a really good tutorial, like a, um, a webinar that is a couple of years old, but it's still really relevant. Lots of good information there. And he's just got so much information. He does student finance specials as well when he has his program um, on. And then also there's the website there for NHS Wales if you want to find out more about that other option and then as you've already heard you know if you want to get in touch with us after today please do so so we're on um we're on unibuddy at the university as well my details are on there so if you want to get in touch after today please do um so i hope you found that useful like i said it's quite quite a lot to take in um but good luck with your student finance the key message is don't let it put you off going to university know everything inside out, know the situation, and then just throw yourself into university life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linos. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Such a complicated subject, um, but you actually absolutely smashed it in. And also, without wishing to sound like the Martin Lewis fan club, um, he is wonderful. So if you if you want a simple guide to student finance, like a one-page leaflet or, or the webinar that, that Linos mentioned, um, he is the, the go-to man, I completely agree, um, in student finance, so do check out his, his work as well. So our next session is Rebecca Bowen joining us from the University of South Wales. Now I've heard, I'm going to put extra pressure on Rebecca now, so I've heard this, this session separately and it is absolutely fantastic. She's one of the best people that I've ever heard talk about personal statements, so no pressure, Rebecca. Um, she'll talk about things like the ABC method, which is wonderful, and if you are going to apply to university, you're going to need a personal statement and Rebecca will be able to help you with it. So with that, Rebecca, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks, John. No pressure for this next 10 minutes. Um, hi again, everyone. As we hear, Rebecca Bowen, uh, Senior Student Recruitment, of Recruitment Officer at the University of South Wales. Um, I've got 10, 12 minutes to talk you through personal statements. As I said in my introduction, you might be at very different points in the personal statement process. Some of you might not have started yet. Some of you might be right in the middle of it. Some of you might be close to the end. But I'm hoping there'll be some useful things you can take from this session. What do universities look for then? So I think it's fair to speak on behalf of everyone on this call today and other universities as well. Generally speaking, these are the kind of things that universities are looking for in a personal statement. So an understanding of the subject in the course, I'm not going to preach to you about how important research is. You've heard that a lot this evening, but you need to um, understand the course, understand what you're applying for and what, that, what it means to study that course for three or four years at university. You need to show that then in your personal statement. You need to demonstrate a passion and enthusiasm. We want to see that on this in this piece of writing, a real enthusiasm, a passion and interest in the subject you've chosen. We read a lot of drafts that say things like from a young age, ever since I was young, I wanted to study this subject or that subject. Really think about what it is that's motivated you to make an application for this subject and what it is that, that has really um, sparked your interest. Showing that you have the right skills and qualities. So all of you can't see any of you we can just see a list of names but all of you've got plenty of skills and plenty of qualities to offer universities it's just a case of articulating that of getting that down in your personal statement and we've heard in a few of the presentations about the importance of experience experience doesn't have to be five days um at a, an office or five days at a, at a doctor's surgery it can be a num it can come in a number of different forms so subject experience what have you done? What have you engaged with? That's improved your subject knowledge, improved your understanding of the course that you're applying for. 
terms of before you start, so it might be that some of you are a bit further along, like I said, in this process, but we encourage you to do your research, researching the subjects, researching the universities that you're applying to. Um, keeping a record of your progress is a good idea. So if you are a year 12 student or maybe even younger than that, it's never too early to start making note of the things that you're doing, either in school or college or maybe outside of school or college. Because it can be really hard when you get to um, the autumn term of year 13 or your second year of college, you've got to start writing a personal statement. You've done all these fantastic things, but you've forgotten about them. Um, so making a note somewhere, it might be notes on your phone, it might be in a, in a, in a notebook that you've got, a, a file on your computer or, or, or one of your devices that just makes a note of the things that you're getting involved with now so you'll be able to talk about them later and also thinking about the skills that you've got my advice would be if you're really keen and you're thinking about when you log off this call this evening making a start on a personal statement getting a blank piece of paper and writing down everything you can think of skills experiences interests anything that you've done not all of those things are going to make it into a into your final version of a personal statement, but it's certainly easier if you've got all of those things down on a piece of paper that you can check them off and pick out the ones that are going to be most relevant to you. Some technical information then about the personal statement. Um, it's the only section of the form that you, you have total control over. You decide what is said in that personal statement. Yes, you'll receive feedback from teachers, maybe parents, maybe friends, but ultimately you're the person who decides what information you're sharing about yourself with the universities. It's 47 lines and 4,000 characters, including spaces, which sounds like an awful lot, but in reality, that's just over a side of A4, one side of A4. And often, more often than not, when I meet students who've drafted personal statements, they're cutting things out because they've gone over that word or character limit rather than adding, having to add things in. You've got one personal statement and that gets sent to all of your university choices. Really, really important that you realise you can't tailor it for each course or for each university. It's one document and a copy gets sent to all of your choices. And there's no spelling or grammar check on the UCAS application. I think we've become used to having red lines appear under things that we might have misspelled or autocorrect. That doesn't happen on the UCAS form. So you need to make sure that you're drafting that personal statement in words, that you're undertaking spelling and grammar checks and having another two or three pairs of eyes over it before your final version gets pasted onto your UCAS form. John's a big fan of the personal statement ABC. This has been around for a long, long time. I think it originated with UCAS. I can't take the credit for it. Um, so if you take one, uh, one thing from my presentation this evening, I'd encourage you to take this one. So activity benefit course, the personal statement ABC. So good personal statements talk about activities. These are all the things that I've done. And, and this, I just want to tell you about them. Better personal statements talk about activities and the benefit to you through doing these activities. So that could be the skills that you've developed, the knowledge you've developed, etc. And then the best personal statements are able to talk about activities, the benefit to you, and then how that links back to the course. And on the next slide, I'll just emphasize this in a bit more detail. So as an example, I'm the captain of the school football team. It doesn't have to be football, it doesn't have to be school, but an example of an activity that you've been part of. Through this role, I develop my interpersonal and my team working skills. This is relevant to business studies, the course I want to study, as being able to communicate effectively is an important skill when working on group projects. So you can see there that this person has thought about what they've done, how it's benefited them, and how that's going to be relevant to the course they want to study. And as I said, often students overwrite, so their first or second draft is much, much longer than it needs to be. So when you're having to cut things down, when you're having to cut things out, keep this ABC in your mind. Um, have I talked about activities? Have I talked about the benefit to me? Have I talked about the course? If not, they're the things that you can think about getting rid of. Very briefly on structure. So your personal statement does need a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, your beginning part of your personal statement should have an opening paragraph. In that opening paragraph, it should be absolutely clear to us the course that you've chosen. Snappy opening lines can be tricky. There's some really good and some really bad examples out there. And often students leave that opening line until they've written more of their personal statement and then maybe come back to it when they've got a bit better idea of what, what they want to say. 
and thinking about everything that goes into that personal statement. You should be encouraging the person who's reading it to read on. We've all had to read things, perhaps as part of our school or college work or something else. We're, we're not partic- finding it particularly interesting. We have to read it. So we're sort of skim reading it, not giving it our full attention. You don't want to be in that position with your personal statements, making sure that it's as interesting as possible and it really grabs the attention of the person who's reading it. The middle part, the longest part of the personal statement, this should demonstrate what you understand about the course. So that's why it's so important that you've done that research that we've heard about this evening. Experience, skills and qualities you have. Why are you a good candidate? Why should we offer you this this, uh, place on this course? We know that students, particularly sixth form students, 16, 17, 18 year olds, aren't big fans of sort of talking positively about themselves. They think they're showing off. They think that they're bragging. They think that they sound a bit arrogant. If you've got examples to back up those skills that you've got, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that you have really strong skills in a particular area or you're really good at something. This is your chance to shine and to tell universities about that. And as I said, why you're suitable for the course. And even though this is the body of your personal statement, the most, this is where the most of the information goes, you should always keep that quality over quantity in mind, okay? And a concluding paragraph. It's really important that you've got a short paragraph in there that kind of rounds off the personal statement. I've read lots of drafts over the years where students have just ended their personal statement. There's no conclusion. I think it's often because they've run out of space or run out of characters. So it just needs to be a very short paragraph, key points, key strengths, things that you want to just emphasize again before you finish your personal statement, the things you want to leave the person who's reading, reading the statement with. This could address your future plans as well. So if you have got an idea of where you'd like to be in five years time or the industry or the job or something that you'd like to get into after university, then you can tell us about that in your your closing paragraph. In terms of language, um, avoid using complicated language. Often students think this is for university, so I need to use the longest, most complicated language I can possibly think of, technical terms. And um, we, tr- we try and encourage students not to do that because if they've chosen a term or a, or a word that they haven't seen before, but they've used it because they want to cr- try and create an impression, if they use it in the wrong way, um, that often doesn't create the impression that they're hoping to. And really important that you vary the verbs that you use. We see a lot of I will, I have, I've been, I went. Um, thinking about words like accomplish, achieve, produce, design, originate, resolve just makes it more interesting, more interesting for yourself as as the writer, but certainly more interesting for the person who's reading it. Once it's written, so once you've got a first or a second draft, checking the spelling grammar I've mentioned, really, really important. Giving it to someone else to read, someone you trust. Um, More than likely, if you're at school or college, there's going to be a a process for that. There's going to be a teacher or teachers that you go to. Um, You might want to show to a friend, to a parent, to someone, like I say, someone else that you trust and their opinion on it. Reading it in isolation and reading it out loud. This sounds like a bit of an odd tip, but... um, one of the suggestions we can make is if you've got a recording device or something, an app on your phone, you can record it, read your personal statement out loud and record yourself reading it. Often students are not comfortable with this. They don't, don't like the sound of their own voice. But the reason that you do it is because if you've been working on your personal statement, could be for a number of weeks, you're so close to it, it becomes sort of a jumble of words on a screen that actually listening back to a recording of yourself, a recording of your personal statement, you'll be able to spot things that you won't perhaps be spotting when you're reading it. So if you've said a particular word several times, you might not see it on screen, but you'll certainly hear it in a recording. So uh, a bit of a tip for you there um, once you've got a draft ready for your, of your personal statement. Things not to do then, just to finish off, um, don't use cliches and quotes. You can Google personal statements. You'll see some really good and some really bad examples. I've read a lot of Nelson Mandela quotes over the years, a lot of Martin Luther King quotes over the years. Universities want to hear what you've got to say. So you don't need to quote um, famous politicians or, or actors or authors. Keep Use your own words. Don't reference TV programmes. So there are a lot of good factual TV programmes out there that have really inspired uh, students to study particular subjects. Speaking to a student recently, Blue Planet really inspired her to uh, to study marine biology. 
But at the University of South Wales, I mentioned, we've got things like policing, nursing. So we see a lot of Holby City, a lot of line of duty, we've got forensics. So we see a lot of NCIS, New York or Miami. It's really, really important that you demonstrate that you understand what the course is. Quoting TV programmes like Line of Duty, and if you expect every day to be like Line of Duty when you're studying policing at university, then you haven't quite grasped what that experience is going to be like. So, so no referencing sort of TV, fictional TV programmes or films. Don't just list your experiences, expand on them. Remember that ABC. Don't refer to information that's covered elsewhere. We've heard about the application, the information that's required. You don't need to tell us which school or college you're at. You don't need to tell us your age, where you live. All of that information is available to us on another part of the form. So don't waste that space in your personal statement. Don't name the universities you're applying to. So universities can't see which other universities you've applied to. So don't give that information away in your personal statement. And I'm sure no one on this call will be tempted ever to lie or exaggerate on a personal statement. And there's no need for you to either. You've all got enough brilliant things to say. Um, but if you are tempted to lie or exaggerate and you're interviewed as part of this process, university staff are very experienced to kind of find it out um, what's true and what's not during that interview process. So, so definitely don't uh, don't say anything that isn't true. And just want to finish on a really important point around plagiarism. All personal statements are, are screened across a database that UCAS has got called Copycatch. That stores copies of every personal statement that has been submitted up to this date, including those submitted in the same year. Um, and it also includes other bits of information that are commonly perhaps plagiarised from other areas on the web. Anything that's more than 10% similar is automatically flagged to UCAS. UCAS then contact universities, they'll contact you and they'll contact your school or college or centre. And um, it's up to universities, there's no rule uh, for how universities should respond to this. Some universities might say, okay, we're not thrilled about this, but if you want to submit another application, another personal statement, we'll take a look at it. Some courses, some universities absolutely will not accept another application from you. So don't put yourself in that position. It must all be your own work. Anything that goes in that statement must be your own work. Don't be tempted to copy a line or two from something that you see online. Everything has to be your work. Appreciate that was a bit of a whistle stop to all the personal statements, but you will have the recording available. Um, as we've heard from other universities this evening, the importance of open days. We're delighted to be delivering uh, on campus open days again, and we've got one this Saturday across all campuses. It's not too late, you can book your place at the URL on the screen. Diolch Varian, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Always great talking about personal statements. Always brilliant advice. Um, really, really, really good session. And one question we had before Rebecca's session is, is one student, and hopefully um, they don't mind me putting them on the spot, but they said, can we mention about attending this as part of personal statement? Of course you are welcome to, but if you do the ABC really well, I think you're going to have too much content to be able to um, talk about events like this. So ABC is really good, really good session, Rebecca, really appreciate that. So that's Rebecca Bowen joining us from the University of South Wales. So now if I, for the, um, just to take stock of where we are, we've got two more sessions this evening. One is looking at your mental health and wellbeing at university, and then the final session is for the, the Welsh-speaking audience with us talking about bilingual and Welsh language opportunities at university. If I can now pass over to Becky. Becky is joining us from Wrexham Green Bay University, and Becky's going to give us is deliver a session looking at mental health and wellbeing, which is such an important area, as we all know. And with that, uh, Becky, I'll pass things over to you, please. So thank you, John. I'm Becky. I work for Wrexham Glyn Door University, and today we're going to talk about um, well-being, particularly well-being during the pandemic and well-being looking towards you guys applying to university. Um, it's a really stressful time applying to university and making your decisions on your future. Um, so I completely understand if it can be a little bit phasing. Um, but if you're starting to look at your well-being now, if you're starting to make plans for how you can protect your well-being during this time, that's great. As a society, we are also looking at well-being a lot more, particularly due to the pandemic. Um, your part well-being has, be has become the centre of kind of everything and you hear information from everywhere about how to improve your well-being. The first thing that I want to do is start off this presentation by saying understand that well-being is a journey, it's not a destination. Um, so you are naturally going to have setbacks 
when improving your well-being, you're naturally going to um, have moments where you feel absolutely amazing. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to be this perfect Instagram guru who knows exactly how to meditate and do does yoga twice a day. Take time for yourself and understand what you can actually incorporate into your personal life. With that, that being said, today we're going to give five top tips on um, how to improve your well-being um, and how to start looking after yourself a little bit. So our first tip is to be grateful. Um, now, grateful obviously means that you are understand what you have and understand um, the appreciate the things that you have. So one way that we suggest doing this is to create a gratitude diary and each morning write three things um, in your life that you're thankful for. This could be spending more time with your family. This could be keeping safe and healthy. And it could be that you have a nice garden to spend time in um, when the sun is shining. It could be the big moments in life and it could be the little moments in life or it could be something that is continually there or not there. It could be a variety of things. So to give you an example of being grateful, I've cho chosen three of my own. Um, so I'm grateful that my partner started a new job. He wasn't great at really enjoying his previous job. Um, so that's a big life, life change that is something that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for my cat. Uh, so here's a picture of my lovely cat. Um, but that's something that's continual that I'm always grateful for. And I'm also grateful for the autumn leaves on the way to work. Um, so obviously that's dependent on the actual um, seasons. I massively love autumn, but that's something that I decided I was very grateful for um, when I was writing this presentation. Um, this will really help you to create a positive mindset and is proven to increase happiness and can even lead to better sleep. Um, at the end of the day, you could also use this time to reflect on any positives of the day. Um, so this could be what you've achieved, did you um, have anything unexpected happen? Did you receive a nice email or a message um, or have a nice lunch or meal with family? And um, this positive reflection can help you to increase your positive mindset, um, which again, increases your happiness. So for example, my positive experience is that I met lots of people at the university. I started my job during the lockdown. Um, so being able to meet lots of people and kind of expand in that way, um, and get to know the university and my job was a massive positive experience. The next tip would be to be kind. So this applies to yourself as well as others, um, as often we are our biggest critics. Um, but it's really important at the moment and while you're applying for university that you don't give yourself too much of a hard time as you're adjusting to not only the way that we are living at the moment, but you're also adjusting to looking forward in the future. Um, one thing that I would recommend is setting a goal each day. Um, and when you achieve it, it can make you feel really positive. There will be days when you do more on days where you do less. And that's OK. So remember that tomorrow's a new day. So anything that hasn't been done today can be done tomorrow. And um, be kind to your family as well, as they'll be going through their own stresses and worries, particularly with you applying to university. They might be trying to um, encourage you to do your personal statement and there might be some frustration there, but understand that they're probably coming from a good place. Um, so taking into account other people's feelings as well. Um, and also be kind to your friends as well. As often, we put a face on about um, how we are feeling to others. So simple things like a positive comment on social media or just sending a nice message can really make a difference to someone's day. Um, and share kindness is our final bit of this section. Um, so genuinely believe that if you share kindness, then you create a loop of positivity and kindness. So helping others to feel valued can make a difference to both their days and yours. Being active is our third tip. Um, so studies have actually shown that as little as 15 minutes of activity a day can really have a positive effect on reducing depression and anxiety as it, it releases endorphins, dopamine and serotonin, which kind of gives you the runner's high, making us feel great. Um, getting fresh air is also a great thing. It helps you to clear your mind. It helps you to kind of relax and also being one with nature and being able to walk into the trees. I know when I'm feeling a little bit stressed, going out and having a walk is a great opportunity to take a minute away. 
Um, you could also get involved in loads of different types of exercise. So it doesn't necessarily have to be walking. It could be running, cycling, dancing, yoga. Um, if you're interested in kind of aerial arts or anything like that, that's also positive as well. Just getting out there and doing something and getting your body moving is great for your mental health. Um, and this will boost both your physical and your mental health as well. Um, if you are struggling to engage within um, any positive, um, like being active activity, um, then getting a friend to get involved um, in you working out is a great opportunity as well because you can use that to socialize and you can also use that time um, to exercise as well. So, um, so our fourth tip is to be mindful. So mindfulness and meditation is like flossing your teeth for anxiety. So it prevents buildup of anxiety and stress. Um, practice practicing these can help to acknowledge your thoughts and feelings and learn to accept them which in turn reduces the impact and stress that they can cause just taking time to breathe slower can help you to relax and release tension in your muscles and um, you can start with just five minutes a day and build it up from there or if you're really lost and not sure how to start there's lots of apps that can help you so here are some of the examples of the apps that we use. Um, a member of my, my team who actually originally wrote this is a yoga teacher, yoga instructor. So these are some of the apps that she used and I've added my own as well. Um, so you've got Headspace, Headspace, Maya, Petit Bambao, um, Oak, Mindfulness and um, Headspace and Simple Habit is the one that I use. So both Simple Habit and Headspace, you can customize the, one of them you can customize the meditation. So you can choose what situation you're in, what you need right now, how long you've got and just go with it. So I can't remember which one of the apps, but it's a great opportunity to learn about mindfulness and kind of take yourself to that moment. And fifth and final tip is to stay connected. So keep in touch with the people that matter. If you are struggling with anxiety, negative thoughts or adjusting to life in lockdown or adjusting to going to university, then make time to talk about your feelings to your friends or family, um, as it's very likely that they'll have similar thoughts or feelings. Now, this applies even to university. So if you are starting university and you're feeling really homesick, I started feeling really homesick, um, but I managed to find someone who I could empathise with, who was my friend, who was also going through a similar experience. So I definitely recommend um, Kind of becoming friends with someone and talking about your feelings and finding that camaraderie. Keep in touch with teachers, colleges and university staff at Wrexham. We are a really inclusive university and we have a lot of support on offer for students and a lot of the universities I'm sure on the call will also offer similar support. So it's really important that if you are feeling down, if you are feeling like you need help, um, notify those people who you might trust. Um, they may not have the answers immediately, but it's really important that just talking to someone, um, the old saying is a problem shared is a problem halved. So it's really important to have that conversation with them if you feel like you need to have that conversation. So we've obviously gone through the five top tips, which were, uh, be grateful, be kind, be active, be mindful and stay connected. But I just wanted to leave you with this little final, um, say a final information basically and um, so whilst we can't control the world around us we can control how we deal with it by implementing these small measures to help us cope so just take each day at a time control what you can and just let the rest go and I wanted to share this image which is from the Mayan journal and um, which was actually sent to me by my mother-in-law and um, but it's everything that's kind of in your control and everything that's out of your control so you don't have control of other people's time other people's feelings other people's opinions but you have control of your own, own boundaries your thoughts your eating your self-care and consider what's important to you um, if you're looking for further resources on this, the following organisations can help with information on mental health and anxiety. So you've got Mind, Mental Health, Young Minds and NHS UK. Um, 
And if you are interested in potentially learning more about our university and about all our inclusive services that we offer, um, we have a virtual open day on the 26th of January and an on-campus one on the 26th of February. I know that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour as well of mental health and wellbeing, but I hope it helps you guys in your application for university um, and good luck. Thank you, Becky. That was absolutely fantastic. And, and to um, I know you said to do it in the morning, but to go with your, your grateful point, I'm very grateful for that session. Very grateful for the speakers that have given up their evenings tonight to, to support you as students to make great university choices. And also very grateful for students that have given up their time tonight to hopefully make really good decisions in the future. So thanks, Becky. Join us from Wrexham and Bay University. That was an absolutely fantastic session. Um, so what we're going to do now is, 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 is the final session is going to look at Welsh language and bilingual opportunities at university. So if you're watching this and you don't speak Welsh, the final session, I'm afraid, will be delivered in Welsh. It's looking at Welsh language and bilingual opportunities. So if you are looking, if you are a non-Welsh speaker, it's probably where we say farewell. You're welcome to stay for the, for the final session, but, but it will be delivered in Welsh. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Rebecca Bowen at the University of South Wales to introduce Lowry, who is our final speaker. Over to you, Rebecca. Diolch John, um, session all and off son Vesli, half an equal no Lori Bullman or colleague can write Kennedy Thong. See me in Charlotte, I'm Kavlio, can write Adwi Thong and Prefer Scotland can be Diolch Lori. Yeah, so um, Lori Dwi Adwi Thong or colleague can write Kennedy Thong. Um, but if you prefer colleague, well, then in the Spruggy Kavlio, the studio, uh, Kavron can write Adwi Thong, give a verwer. Um, a Henry Mount partner yes ever previous previous gyd ar draws Cymru. Sefydliadau a this bellach a dar parwyr pentysiaethau hefyd. Felly, dwi'n dwi'n sôn ys oedd y deg mynydd nes yma am yr er ymrediad o gyrsia sydd i gael trwy gyfryngau Gymraeg. Yr er adnoddau gwych sy'n yna um, trwy gyfryngau Gymraeg. Yr er ysgol o'r eithau sydd yn arian ychwanegol allwch chi gael i asidio trwy gyfryngau Gymraeg a'r llwyth o'r fanteision sy'n yna um, efo addysg uwch trwy gyfryngau Gymraeg. Felly, os nai gychwyn i sôn am y cyrsia, mae'n abron i fil o gyrsia'r gael yn rhannol neu yn gyfan gwbl trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg. A'r lle gorau i ddechrau chwilio am y cyrsia yna yn amrywio o feddygaeth i, I um, beirianeg i fathemateg, ydy mynd i'n gwefan i ar chwilotid cyrsia. Felly, dwch chi'n gwaed o'r fideo yma yn dangos i chi ble ma hynny, dwch chi'n gallu dewis pa brifysgol yn y cam cyntaf, a chwedyn yn yr ail gan wedyn fyddwch chi'n mynd ymlaen i ddewis pa bwnc neu gwrs sydd o ddordeb i chi. Os ddoch chi ddim yn siŵr eto, allwch chi glicio mwy nag un yn fanno. A chwedyn yn y cam olaf wedi'r mae'r canyniadau yn dangos y brifysgol, pa gwrs nath o chi ddewis, er canran o'r cwrs sydd i gael trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg hefyd, a ddoch chi'n gweld yr arwydd pint yna, yn golygu bod chi'n gallu cael arian ychwanegol yn y banc am astudio er rhan o'r cwrs trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg. A na sôn mwy am yr arian yna yn y munud. Mae'r bocs chwilio cyflym hefyd ar gael ar ych cyfer chi yn fanno. Felly lle gwych rili i ddechrau ar y gwaith yn chwilio. Nid yn unig maen y gyrsiau gael trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg, ond maen a adnoddau gwych i gael hefyd i chelpu chi yn y brifysgol. Um, am gwefan y porth ydy hwn sy'n cynnwys adnoddau, um, fideos ac yn y blaen, bydd o help i chi pan ydych chi'n gwneud eich astudiaethau yn y brifysgol. Felly rhyw beth i gofio um, am hynny pan fyddwch chi yn y brifysgol. Felly, at yr ysgol yr eithau, yr arian ychwanegol allwch chi gael. Mae'r coleg Cymraeg yn gallu cynnig hyd at 2,000 o binau chi am astudio rhan o'ch cwrs trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg. Mae prifysgol yn unigol hefyd yn cynnig arian ychwanegol, felly cofi chofyn iddyn nhw hefyd am hynny. O ran y coleg Cymraeg, mae yna nifer o ysgol yr eithau ar gael i chi, fel y gwelwch chi yn fan yma. Um, y brif ysgoloriaeth yn gallu cynnig hyd at 2,000 o binau chi. Um, astudio o leiaf 66 y cant o'r cwrs trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg yn rhan o'r brif ysgoloriaeth. Fel y gwelwch chi, mae'r dyddiad cau ar y saethfed o ionawr. Wedyn yn ei mlaen at yr ysgoloriaeth cymhelliant, uh, 1,500 o binau dyma'n hyn 
am astudio o leaf to the tree account or course to govern a gumrag. But the beard are Gorvan Hen are a peduary of I, a queer mind wedding he that Tia Mies had drev Pamaduchi and a brief skull, but he couldn't have a belly in Ilhi and Van Hen. Banasi Dangos are a collotted Kersha, or so he moan Ivana I weld Pagersha to the gumwise of Gever at a scorry thema. Then a kinnig a scorry from the gut had it for breathing. I can't be near a rather little duck in bill, mag and a muscarita erish and banna balaguelchi at a screen. And there were a very on the canon tav, Gwyneth, a canis moan, Bethy Cobby Hedrick, a gun moy of an older Amar Haney. Bethy Mangabla Guichi Gal, Bachmuarian and a bank, come with a human debris of skull. Bethy sitting Gisha Wedden, Elk Jow in Guevani, Marhoth Vanillion Gal and Banna. Er for them guys at Teller and Mordek and a blind, but the Och Jow Ivana. A cover Cassistian at Gadani Habit, also seen real question negative. Rudison am Gimman Tishon and Barod, or in life Derarian or Honegal at Rigal, or Mana Niver Vaur or Mantishon Eri Rigal. Dyma um, Ella Rwan yn sôn pam na thi fynd ymlaen i studio trwy gyfwng y Gymraeg yn y brif ysgol. Helo, enw fydd i Ella. Mi'n dweud ag i'n le ddoed ac yn ystod job gwyddor chwrreion ac ymarfer corff yn rhyw ysgol mae'r sgoledd Cyrdi. Y brif reswm penderfynu si a studio ran am cwrs trwy gyfwng y Gymraeg, oedd oherwydd bod fy holl addysg gen ti fod yn dwi'n y ddoed wedi fod yn y Gymraeg, Ac felly ni'n tynnu lot fe hyderus ac yn fwy cyfforddus yn unig ysgol yn gwybron i mi'n parhau fy addysg um, yn yr un iaith. Y brif mantes o Stygion y Gymraeg yw bod y dosbarthiadau'n llai um, ac felly yn enwedig pan eich unrhyw yn cyntaf, mae'n cyfle gwych i chi ddod i adnabod pawb yn eich dosbarth. Mae'r tutoriaid a'r um, darlithwyr i gyd yn dod i adnabod chi fel unigolion a chi'n dod i greu cymuned bach mewn ffordd sy'n, sy'n rhoi'r teimlo bach o gysur bod chi'n adnabod pawb. Um, mantis arall yw eich bod chi jyst yn defnyddio'r iaith. Mae'n cymaint o fantes a chi siar y cymraeg um, yn enwedig pan eich chi'n chwilio am swydd yn y dyfodol ac felly mae'r dysgu'r terminoleg yn y Gymraeg nawr um, a defnyddio'r iaith, parhau ddefnyddio'r iaith nawr a mae'n i fod o fydd enfor i chi pan eich chi'n chwilio am swydd yn y dyfodol. Um, ac yn amlwg mantis arall yw'r ysgoloriaethau. Mae modd ennill ysgoloriaeth hyd at 3,000 o bennoedd gyda'r coleg sy'n amazing. Um, ond ni'n digon ffordus i ennill um, ysgoloriaeth, oedd yn golygu fod ychydig bach mewn uh, arian y fymogedd i pob blwyddyn sy'n mantis enfawr, parch i'n stiwdant, spith arian gen i. Ond mae mwy o bywydaeth am yr ysgoloriaethau ac ati ar wefan y coleg Cymraeg. Um, Mae hefyd Instagram um, dwi'n dyfodol di, lle mae llisgynhadon fel fi yn rhan i'n profiad yn ni ac yn um, dangos i chi bywyd fel myfyrwyr ac yn ateb cwestiynau um, ac ati felly cer i ddilyn hynny fyd. Diolch yn fawr. Felly, nes i sôn am nifer o fanteision yn fanna, um, mae gynna i fanteision fan hyn yn ddweithog i chi os na ydych chi yn um, wedi digall y fideo hynny. Um, mae'n gam naturiol i ddilyn addysg Gymraeg um, arian ychwanegol, uh, grwpiau'n llai, um, dosbygu sgiliau dweithog, paratoad i'r byd gwaith uh, a gwrdysau brofiadau gwahanol. Mae'n gyfle i ddysgu termau arbenigol mewn dwy iaith a chyfle i, I dderbyn y disgysgu'r sgiliau iaith a fyddai'n um, sôn am y hynny yn y man. Ond mae hefyd, um, nid yn unig yr astudio yn, yn bwysig, ond hefyd y cyfle i gymdeithasu trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg. Mae bod chi'n magu hyder um, mewn sefyllfa um, sydd ddim o'r ffurfiol ac mewn darlith neu seminar, a cyfle i wneud ffrindiau newydd ac yn y blaen mewn ymrywiaeth o glybiau a cymdeithasau cyfrwng Cymraeg hefyd um, ar draws prifysgolion yng Nghymru, bod yn chwaraeon, yn gerddorol, um, neu siwpiau ac yn y blaen. Fel y soniad Ella, mae'n alot wybodaeth ar ein Instagram um, at dyfodol di. Cyfle i chi um, siarad y fawr yn y fyrwyr, cyfle i chi oli cwestiynedd yn nôl yn yr Insta Takeovers ac yn y blaen. Mae gynnau ni uh, podlediad hefyd, Zoom Students, cyfle i wrando 
ar um, uh, y fyddlwyr yn siarad am gwahanol y thymau ac yn y blaen. Felly cofiwch ddilyn ni ar at dwy'r dyfodol di yn fano. Y falle bod rhai nhw chi uh, yn gwrando ac yn meddwl falle bod chi ddim yn teimlo yn ddigon hyderus yn eich Cymraeg. Uh, falle bod chi ofn mentro i fynd ymlaen i astudio trwy gyfer yn Gymraeg yn y brif ysgol. Dyma Curtis uh, Richards, roedd o'n teimlo bach yn ddi hyder cyn mynd i'r brif ysgol. Um, Doedd o ddim yn siarad y Cymraeg adre a ddim wedi cymryd hasty llawer um, yn y Gymraeg tu allan yr ysgol chwaith. Felly iddo fo, oedd o'n bwysig yr gael mynd ymlaen wedyn i'r brif ysgol i barhau i wella a'i gadw sgiliau Cymraeg hefyd. A yn egys gyna fo i chi ydy peidio i'ch o ffoini am ystudion y Gymraeg, mae'n y gyfnogaeth o'r gael i chi a fyddwch chi byth ar ben y chynnen. Ymlaen at y byd gwaith i gael gweld y manteision sy'n a o fynd ymlaen i ystudio trwy gyfnod Gymraeg yn y prif ysgol, ydy bod na um, nifer gofnioedd y cymiau mawr sydd yn gofyn am y sgiliau dwyitho cynnu. With the dai cant of his nest and hammer in the way, but the Nathur Gamraik and Hunaki Quarth at the Gusan Ethno. Satagin a cant of the vlog wearing Hammeri and Govin and Skilly Kamraik with Gavlogi with her now with. A company a maur, fell boots, Santander, a canabline, and to wait for the Gamraik of Vantes, a hangy business no, and but the Nathur Gamraik and Denny Cosmeriaid now with. But it doesn't well born up a sick ruid even of your Skilly and Anna Beat Gwyth. Ac um, yn y prif ysgol wedyn, dych chi'n datblygu eich sgiliau yna, datblygu termynoleg arbenigol, datblygu hyder, fel bod chi'n gallu ddynyddio'r sgiliau yna pam dych chi'n trio am swydd ar ôl gadael y prif ysgol. Felly dyma um, lle ydych chi'n dilyn ni cael mwy wybodaeth um, drwy um, yn cyfryngau cymdeithasol ni. Mae gynnwn ni um, sianel ar YouTube, cael y Cymraeg efo lot o fideos am rywiol yn fanna fydd yn werth i chi i um, edrych arni nhw, mwy o fideos fel oedd Ella um, ac yn y blaen yn fanna i chi. Felly beth bynnag fydd eich llwybr chi, cofiwch ddynyddio'r Gymraeg a cofiwch hefyd ymilodi fo'r coleg, mae gwybodaeth fel a i gael ar yn gwefan ni. A dwi'n dwi orffen felly, dwi am dangos fideo i chi gan Ellis. Oh, hello. Tre mae'n fel mae'r rhan fwyfan eich yn gwybod, fi yn gallu siarad Cymraeg. O, mae fi addysg Cymraeg o dyn ni yn mynd yn bell yn ôl. Mae'r addysg Cymraeg wedi rhoi llwyth y gyfreoedd i fi. Er enghraifft, fi wedi bod yn cydgyflwyno ar sioe radio bach. Wel, bod eto! A oedd eich yn gwybod, gallech chi gael hyd at 3,000 o bunau trwy stydion a iaith Cymraeg. Wi'r i chi. A mae'r wybodaeth chwiliwch am coleg Cymraeg cenedaethol. Iechyd da... a... Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi. A gobeithio bod chi wedi cael bydd o'r cyfriniad a bod chi'n gweld bod yna lot o bantisio neu astudio trwy gyfryngau Gymraeg. Cysylltwch y fyny am fwy wybodaeth yn ymwedig efo'r ysgol ar eithau. Um, diolch i gyd am ymuno, am ymuno heno. Thank you all for attending the uh, webinar tonight and all the best with your choices for the future. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Um, really, really appreciate that. So um, we've come to the end of the evening now. Really big thank you to all our speakers. Um, in order of the, the, the presentations, we um, seems like a long time ago now, but Hannah, Hannah presented and um, opened things up. Then we had Laird, uh, Rebecca, Linos, Becky, and also Larry. So big thank you to everyone. If you've got any questions after the session, you'll get an email from us with the link to access the recording. If you've got absolutely any questions, come back to me and I'll liaise with the speakers for you. But a big thank you from me um, and do enjoy the rest of the evenings. Thanks all. See you soon.